Well, folks, it's uh, great to see you out and uh, this father and uh, some folk have gone on holiday and, and they're getting a great weather for it. But well, we've come together to worship God and the very first um, it reminds us of, of our priority and it's all I once held dear and it's focuses on who Christ is. Let's stand as we worship. Let's all pray together. Lord, that's exactly how we feel. We are delighted that we know you, that it's possible for us to know you, that you are indeed the God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and yet we can call you our Father. We have that relationship with you over this day. We've been celebrating Father's Day in lots of different ways as We've received cards or gifts or meals as we have the opportunity to spend time with our family and our friends. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, the one who is always there for us, the one who, when he promises, is able to keep every promise. You're the God that when you say that you'll be with us until the end of the age, and you'll be with us to the end of the world. We know that you keep your promise. And so you've been with us this day as we've rejoiced already, as we've met together, as we've sang and as we've read, as we've prayed and as we've studied. You've been with us this afternoon as we've enjoyed fun and fellowship and relaxation. And now as we're again meeting as your people here in Sydney, we thank you that you are here among us. And you're here to bless us, to minister to us. And yet, Lord, we're conscious that although we call you our Father, and you are, you're also the Holy God, 
the God who cannot look upon sin. And so we take this opportunity at the very beginning of our service to come and confess our sin before you. We have sinned against others, but we've certainly sinned against you. And Lord, we come and we ask you to forgive us. We are truly sorry. We feel like the prodigal son. Whenever he realized as he was eating the, the muck that the pigs were eating, he realized he came to his senses and thought, I have to go back to my father and say I'm sorry. He recognized that he wasn't worthy again to be his son. And he hoped that he could be his servant. And Lord, that's how we feel. You have done so much for us. Lord, we sang about that this morning. We studied that this morning as we considered again that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, should become sin for us. You have done so much. And we have failed you. We've sinned against you, and we're truly sorry. Forgive us. Cleanse us again. Help us never to take your grace for granted. Never allow us to expect your mercy. You actually tell us that you will forgive us, but you also tell us that we need to forgive others. And so again, at this service, as we ask for forgiveness, we want to declare to you in our hearts that we forgive those who have sinned against us. Those who have maybe wronged us or said something against us or done something against us. We forgive them. We don't want to be like that man in the parable who received great forgiveness from the king and then when he met a neighbor who held him little, that he got him by the throat and demanded that he would be put in jail, and yet he'd been forgiven so much. We don't want to be like that. We want to be free in forgiving others, because you have forgiven us so much. Help us to do that at the beginning of this service, as we think of those who have maybe sinned against us. We forgive them, Lord, for you have forgiven us so much. And we pray, Lord, that as we sing and as we pray, that we will be very conscious that you are here. And this will be a great time spent in the presence of a great God. Continue to lead and guide us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great blessings of having Jesus and having the Holy Spirit living within us is that we have that assurance, that assurance that Jesus is mine. And we're going to sing about that now. Let's stand as we worship.
As I say, we're continuing to, we looked at Samuel, we're now going to look at David, and so we'll continue on our study of First and Second Samuel. It's First Samuel chapter 16, and we'll read from verse 14. Uh, this is God's word. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant and said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit comes, when from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. When the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come upon Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. Amen. Let's all pray. Father, again we come before you and we thank you for this great weather. We thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy being out and about. We can enjoy, Lord, the, the warmth that we have with the sunshine. And Lord, we feel good. And yet we recognize, Lord, that despite the weather, life goes on. For there's some folk who are grieving tonight. There's other folk who have received bad news tonight. And there's other folk who are sitting with people who are passing on. And so we come, Lord, we want to pray for those people whom we know who are struggling at the moment. Lord, I think of Brian, Lord, uh, in, in Dundella. Lord, he, he got news two weeks ago that, that within the month that he would be dead. And, and Brian is, is nervous and, and concerned. Lord, I want to pray that you'll give me opportunity as I visit, uh, that, Lord, that as I speak with him and as I pray with him, that I'll be able to share the hope which is found in you. Lord, you don't promise us eternal life on this earth. You don't promise that we will live forever on this earth. But you do promise that we can have eternal life with you if we trust in who you are. And for each one of us, one day we will die. And for some of us, Lord, it can be very sudden. And for others, Lord, there is a time scale where, where we're told. And for Brian, he is aware that he has three, maybe four weeks. Lord, as he prepares lots of things, as he thinks about the funeral and he thinks about his wife and his children, Lord, help him to think about you. The most important preparation of all. So we pray, Lord, be with Brian. Help him and minister to him. And there's lots of people like Brian here in Sydney alone. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us as we speak with people and meet with people that we may encourage them. There's others, Lord, whom we know who are struggling terribly financially at the moment. We ask you, Lord, that you will help us as we spend time with them, as we talk with them, as we help them practically and also as we share with them who you are, that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. But you provide according to your will, not according to our wants or according to what others might have. And so we pray for those, particularly here in Sydney, who are struggling financially. Help them to be realistic in, in their expectations of, of what they need. And Lord, give us wisdom as we speak with them and as we help them. And again, Lord, as a church, we are 
so delighted with, with how you've been leading and guiding us. And as we have plans for the summer, we ask you, you may lead us and guide us as we have plans to, to bless the folk here in Sydney and to glorify you. Help us to remain close to you. And that, Father, we'll see great success in your name in this neighborhood. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, before we come to consider this passage, we sing, and it's reminding us that, that God is filled with compassion when he sees a world that is lost. Let's stand as we, as we sing. As I say, from 1 Samuel 16 onwards, uh, there's less and less about Samuel uh, in this book and more and more about David. There's less and less about Saul and more and more about David. And, and, and this is where this chapter begins to turn, that we know more and more and hear more and more about David. And, and we recognize more and more about the faults of Saul uh, and the mistakes that Saul have made and the judgment of God uh, on Saul. And so we're going to have a look at this passage. We're going to look at, at Saul, first of all, and, and some of the things that it says here are really quite disturbing uh, about Saul and a bit disturbing about what we hear about God. And then we're going to have a look at David. 
David said he had the very heart of God. And, and we're going to have a look at it, and we'll see the servant heart uh, in David in this passage. And there's lots that we can learn from that. First of all, look at Saul. And uh, this is a passage, if you remember, two weeks ago we were looking at when Samuel comes to Jesse's house and, and how God calls him to go to Jesse's house. For God has said, I've rejected Saul. And, and for lots of reasons, but really the, the main reason was that Saul began to think that he was God. Saul began to think that he could do all the things that the kings, the other kings and all the other nations could do. That he didn't need a priest and he didn't need a prophet and he didn't really need God. All the other nations around about it, their God, well, their, their, their king was also their God. Uh, their, their, their king was, was representing God in earth and therefore they, they treated him like a God and the kings could do anything they liked because he was God. That's how they saw it in all the other nations. And, and, and Israel's king was to be different from that. He was to be a representative on behalf of God. He was to rule the people on behalf of God. He was to be like a Kirk session we have in, in the Presbyterian Church. A Kirk session doesn't rule uh, with their own gifts in the sense of or their own intellect or with their own sense of power. The Kirk session in any, in any congregation is to rule like the kings were to rule. In other words, what they were to do is they have to hear what God is saying and they have to pass that on to the people and help the people follow God. That's what the king was to do. Uh, the, the idea of the prophet, the prophet was to hear God's uh, voice and declare it to the people, uh, particularly whenever they were going astray, and he was trying to draw the people back to God. The priest was um, going before God on behalf of the people. The people had sinned, and he was coming before God uh, to ask for forgiveness for that sin. Saul thought he could do all three. And he thought, why, why do we have to go and see God at all? And, and God then said, I've rejected Saul. And, and he sends Samuel to, to Jesse's house. And he, David is chosen by God uh, to be the next king. And then the next passage then is what, just what we're reading now. That didn't mean right away that, that David was to be king. It couldn't mean that because Saul was still on the throne. And in fact, Jesse, if you remember, was very nervous that, that, that he came to his house and was very nervous whenever he said that he anointed David to be the next king because Jesse was very aware that Saul was still the king and Saul was very, very powerful. And, and so Jesse was very nervous at all this. Interestingly, just after this happens then, in verse 14, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Three times, it says, this evil spirit came from God. And I want to have a look at this passage, look at this verse in particular, to try and understand it's been misused many, many times. And ministers and others have, have used it almost to warn people, if you don't agree with me because I'm speaking the half of God, then God can take his spirit away from you. If you, if you. if you fall into sin, God can take his spirit away from you. Uh, if you make a mistake, God can take his spirit away from you. Took it away from Saul, he can take it away from you. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Uh, I've certainly heard it, and in, 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 in particularly in, in, in Glasgow, and some of the places I went to hear preachers. They, they were always saying, if they did it to Saul, they could do it to you. And therefore, you have to keep close to God. You have to obey God. You have to come to church. You have to read your Bible. You have to pray. Because if you don't, then God might take his spirit away from you. Because he did it with Saul, he can do it with you. That's absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And they've misunderstood what the Bible teaches. The Bible says here that the, God took away his spirit from Saul, and God did that. Saul was filled with God's spirit, and he took his Holy Spirit away from him. But the Old Testament is different from the New Testament. Something happened in the New Testament that made it totally different to the Old Testament. And what happened was, whenever Jesus was talking to his disciples in John chapter 14, I said, I am with you for a short time more, but I'll be leaving you soon. But when I leave you, I'm going to ask God, and he's going to send another comforter, and he's going to be with you. The disciples didn't really quite understand what he meant. But then it came the time in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus left them. They thought the time that Jesus left them was the time he died on the cross, and they were devastated. That wasn't the time that Jesus was really talking about. 
Because when Jesus died on the cross on the Friday, he was with them again on the Sunday. They didn't really realize that. And so when he came back again, remember, they couldn't believe it. And then eventually he was with them for 40 days and they were getting used to him again. They thought, boy, this is great. This is really Jesus and he's with us and he's eating with us and he's teaching us. And it's just like the old times. And so 40 days they were enjoying themselves. And then as they were gathered just outside Jerusalem, Jesus ascended into heaven. And they were nervous again because they thought, oh my goodness, that's him away for good. Remember, the two angels said to them, what are you doing looking up to heaven? Because the way you've seen him come up is the way he'll come back again. So don't be standing here looking and, and expecting him to come back at the minute. That's not how it's going to work. Go back to Jerusalem. Go back to where he had told you to go and wait for the Holy Spirit. And as they went back, Acts chapter 2 happened. And it's Acts chapter 2 that makes the New Testament different from the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 2, as they met together to pray, the Holy Spirit came on each one of them and filled them. And when you hear the teaching of Paul and when you see the example of the Christians in the book of Acts and you see how Paul taught and how John teaches, what they teach is this. Once you become a Christian, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Once you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. Paul never, ever tells anybody to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Never. Because when we become a Christian, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes within us. What Paul tells people to do in, in, in Philippians is to be continually filled with the Spirit. In other words, continue to seek God and seek his spirit. That's what Paul tells us. Because Paul realizes, as all the other New Testament believers realize, that when the spirit comes upon us, it's salvation, then that salvation is complete in the eyes of God. That's when, when God looks upon Danny Rankin, he sees someone who is righteous. Why does he see somebody who's righteous? Because Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And as a seal to that, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I will never lose the Holy Spirit. So when I talk to people and I tell people, particularly Roman Catholics, that I'm definitely going to heaven, they think that I'm, uh, I'm presumptuous. They think that I'm arrogant because nobody knows they'll really get to heaven. And even the Pope doesn't know whether he's going to get to heaven because that's why you have to spend time in purgatory. But as Christians, we know we're going to heaven. Why do we know? Because the Spirit lives within us. And once the Spirit lives within us, the Spirit is in us eternally. When he comes within us as Christians, we are eternally saved. That's what it means to be born again. We are a new creation in Christ. And that's what happens in the New Testament. And so therefore, this passage does not mean anything for us in the New Testament as far as the Holy Spirit is concerned. It has lots of things to teach us, of course, but not the fact that we will lose that Spirit. God will never take His Spirit away from you. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and the Spirit came in within you, you will never lose it. And don't care what anybody says. The Bible clearly teaches that you never lose the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it was different. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon certain people at certain times. There's really nobody. David is probably the closest to it. Um, but there's, there's probably nobody apart from maybe David. I don't want to say that David didn't. But apart from David, and I'm even not too sure about David, there's nobody in the Old Testament that you read about that had the Spirit with him the whole time. Remember Samson? Samson was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then God took the Spirit away from him. Other prophets were filled with the Holy Spirit as they, as they preached and as they taught, but they were not continually filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't always have the Holy Spirit in. The Holy Spirit came in the Old Testament on occasions for certain people at certain times. And whenever Saul thought that he could take the place of Samuel or, 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 or any of the prophets or even God, God said, that's enough. I anointed Saul for a purpose. And that was to be king of Israel. And I'm taking that anointing off him. I'm taking my Holy Spirit away from him. And so none of the saints in the Old Testament had the Holy Spirit the whole life, so apart from maybe David. None of them had. They had it for a particular reason, for a particular time, and it could be taken away at any time. And that's what happens here. And so don't ever think that when you read that, that means, can that happen to us? No. It is what we call a new dispensation. This is the old dispensation, and now we're in the new dispensation. Things are different now 
the day Jesus came and died and rose again and his spirit came at Pentecost. That's what makes it different. However, what this passage tells us, and uh, it's not as serious for us because we're in a different dispensation, but it can be close to this, and it's this, that God can take away his hand of blessing on your life. If we are arrogant and if we uh, are disobedient, if we keep doing our own thing, God can allow us then to go down that pathway. And that pathway that we go down is a pathway that is not very pleasant and not very good. So sometimes God can take away his hand of blessing. Sometimes he will give us the things that we wish for. And, 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 and that can turn out to be a curse. God will never take away his spirit from you, but he can sometimes take away his pleasure from you and allow us to do things and to say things that, that are not of his will and that can lead to, to discord and difficulty. That's why even in Christian circles, there's breakdown of relationships, breakdown of relationships in marriage. That's why there can be breakdown of relationships in the church. Uh, Martin was to speak this morning, but he's going to leave it until next week. Uh, and one of the things he'll be saying is judicial commission in the church. He's saying there's more breakdown in relationships in the church today than there ever seemed to have been in the past. And churches are splitting, churches are, 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 are being destroyed by breakdown of relationships. God allowed these things. And that's why when you walk around or you go around Belfast and particularly Glasgow, you see churches as, as cinemas or you see churches as nightclubs or you see churches as, 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 as carpet warehouses or you see churches, there's a church in town that's a, a tattoo parlor and, and used for all different sorts of things. And you think, why would God allow that? God allowed it. I'm convinced God allowed it. Because the people within those churches, and this is not me judging them, but it's, 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 it's by your fruit you will know it, they became a wee club, they became a holy huddle, and they stopped looking outward, and they looked inward. And, and uh, I had a friend who, who lives in, in, in Sydney here, and he went to a particular church in, in, in East Belfast, uh, a church that used to be packed to the doors, a church really quite known, uh, quite well known. And, and they offered their services to be involved in children's work, children's out, outreach work. And the church said, does that mean that you're going to bring in some of the riffraff of this area where the church is, is not a particularly good area? And they said, well, well, we'll invite any of the children from this area to come in. But what happens if they damage the halls? What happens if they scribble in the toilets? We would rather not have those sort of kids in, if you don't mind. If you want to work within the kids in the church, and I think they had two or three kids, then that's okay. But, but we'd rather you not bring their sort of riffraff in. Because we've worked hard at keeping this building well. And there's not many of us left, and, and, and it costs money to keep this well. And we'd rather you didn't. That happened just two years ago uh, in a church in Belfast. I will not be surprised that within 10 years or less that church is closed because they're looking at themselves and not outwardly. And so sometimes God doesn't take away his spirit from Christians, but he sometimes allows us to receive the things that we desire, and that's never a good thing. We should always see God's will and God's glory. And those are the things that we want God to give us. But we want just nice, comfortable lives for ourselves, that God might just give us that, and therefore, that would be a disaster. And then it goes on. The second thing that's really quite troubling. So that's the first thing. God will never take away his spirit from you. If you're really disobedient and you never listen to God, God might allow you to go the way that you're going. But he will one day draw you back. But you'll have a lot of pain in the meantime. The second thing it says here that's really quite strange that lots of people have really not really understood. It says, And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Three times in this passage, from, from uh, verse 14 to verse 23, it says, The spirit that the Lord sent. Now, the spirit that the Lord sent three times is this evil spirit. The evil spirit that has entered into Saul, and he's what we call demon-possessed. And he has this spirit, and from certain times, it makes him feel really, really depressed, uh, and makes him feel as if he's going crazy, and he can't stand uh, the noises in his head. He can't stand the situation he's in. And he doesn't know what to do. It torments him. And it's strange here it says that this evil spirit, now we know that evil spirits are from the pit. 
They're from hell. They're from Satan. And yet it says here, an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What does that mean? I thought we said that God does not do evil. We thought we said that God doesn't give evil to people. So here it says that an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. I think what it means is this. Evil spirits, and I, I don't know about you, but I believe, and the Bible teaches that there's evil spirits. Evil spirits are always trying to torment people. And they're always trying to torment Christians. They would love to torment every single Christian in this place. They would actually love to enter each Christian in this place, torment you, so that your Christian faith means nothing to you. So evil spirits are always want to do that. And in Saul's case, because he has removed his spirit from within him. And that's another thing. A Christian can never be demon-possessed. Uh, they can be oppressed by evil spirits, but they cannot be demon-possessed. It's only people who are not Christians that can be demon-possessed, but that's, that's a sermon for another night. But here in this case, I think what's happening is this. Evil spirits are always wanted to torment us, and evil spirits are always wanted to enter those who are not Christians. And when it says here that this is one from God, I think what God is doing, God is holding these evil spirits. We have no idea what's happening in the spiritual realm, but I believe that God is holding these evil spirits back. And here, in this case, God allows this evil spirit to enter into Saul uh, as part of the punishment that he thought he could be God. Happens later on in the Old Testament with someone else, an even more dramatic sense, it's Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that the evil spirit enters him and he thinks he's a cow and he goes out in the field and eats grass. And why did that happen? It was because Nebuchadnezzar thought he was God. And here in this case, God allows this evil spirit to enter Samuel, or Saul, sorry, Saul, because he thought he was God. God allowed it. It's a wee bit like, I don't know if you've ever uh, gone into a house uh, or into a, a yard and there's dogs on chains and the dogs are growling and, and piercing up at you. And, but they're in chains. And so the dog in itself is evil. The farmer isn't evil, but the dog is evil. But if the farmer was to let the dog off the chain, the dog would go daft. I was in Market Hill uh, a number of years ago. And this farmer had two Alsatians. And they were fierce, really fierce. And they were always chained up, always chained up. But I still hated going to visit uh, this farmer. And one day I went, I went to visit. And any time I went to visit, I always parked the car so I could run into the back door. And, and in farmhouses in Market Hill, and I'm sure many farmhouses, um, once you went a few times, you never rang the doorbell. And you just went in, they, they opened up the door and shouted, hello, it's uh, the Reverend Rankin. And I said, Danny, it was Reverend Rankin here. And they would come out of their kitchen. Oh, come on in, Reverend Rankin, you see. You see. So I always made sure I parked the car so it was close to the door. And even though the dogs were chained up, I was a bit nervous. And you would go open up the door and go in. Well, this day I arrived, parked the car, and I looked around for the dogs. Because uh, even though they're chained, I was very nervous of them. I couldn't see them. I thought, great. And I got out of the car, and I closed the door. And see, as soon as I closed the door, one had come up the front of the car, and one come up the back of the car. They were off the chain. They got me down to the ground and they were pulling me along the yard whenever the farmer came. And of course, one word from him and that was it. My suit was totally torn in shreds. I had to get stitches in my arm. The dog had got me by the arm and by the leg and the two dogs were pulling me along the yard. They were vicious things, absolutely vicious. And I came home and they didn't even pay for the suit. I was, I was distraught, absolutely distraught. And I had a lovely clerical collar on and they didn't pay for that either torn and stretched. In fact, I had to go home before going out to the doctor because I had no trousers on. They were all ripped. Well, I had trousers on, but they were all ripped to shreds. I thought, I can't go down to the doctors like this. And, uh, but the dogs were vicious. And one day, didn't have them on the chain. And I soon knew about it. And actually, ever since then, I never used to be afraid of dogs. But I have to be honest now, I'm, I'm not a fan of dogs. And I'm actually a bit afraid of dogs now ever since that happened. But they were vicious. They were just ready to attack and normally they were in chains. And here, that's what evil spirits are like. And so when it says that God sent them, it's in the sense that God allowed them to go in. And therefore, when we say there's evil in the world, why does God allow evil? Evil is in the world because there's sin in the world. And God would love there to be no sin in the world. But there is sin in the world. And sometimes God allows terrible things to happen because of judgment, 
God allows terrible things sometimes to happen to hopefully bring us to our senses that we might turn to God. Now, that didn't happen with Saul, unfortunately. But that's Saul. What about David? Just for a couple of minutes, I want to look at David. Uh, David shows a servant heart. Just imagine he has been anointed by Samuel. Samuel was at the end of his ministry. Samuel was very, very famous. Samuel was known to be very powerful, and he was known to be a man of God. And therefore, when Samuel came into your village, you were terrified. And we read about that, how when he comes into the, the village in Bethlehem, all the men of the village are terrified. When he asked to go to the house of Jesse, Jesse is terrified. And he's thinking, why have you come here? And, and, and they're really nervous that he's here. So this powerful man, this man of God, anoints him and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. David could have thought, wow. Just like, remember, remember Joseph, when, when he had those dreams? He thought, boy, I'm a big man. I'm a big man. His brothers hated it for him. David was the exact opposite. He went back to the field and continued to work with the sheep. And even when Saul calls for him, he comes into Saul's household. Saul likes him and makes him an armor bearer. There's nothing in the story. And actually, for the next few weeks, when we look at the stories where Saul tries to kill him, there's nothing in the attitude of David where David deems it that he is the king, that he is the rightful king. And therefore, Saul is the one who's in the wrong. There's none of that. He has a servant heart, and he wants to serve Saul, who is the king and who he recognizes as the king. Even though he's been anointed as the next king, he serves Saul. Even though Saul is a madman at times, when he goes into these rages, he tries to kill David, David still serves him. Because David has a, a, a heart after God's own heart. David wants to serve him and minister to him. And how does he serve him? It tells us with music. And lots of people say, well, why do we bother singing in church? Or why do we not sing my favorite songs? The reason we sing uh, is for two reasons. The first reason is to give glory to God. So these songs that we sing are giving glory to God. But the second reason we sing is it does our hearts good. It does our hearts good. Because as we sing these songs to God, we are reminded of who God is, and that's good for our hearts. So if you read a lot of the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms start off with, God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why have you forsaken me? And by the end of the Psalm, it's, Lord, you're a great God. In other words, as the Psalmist writes out and, and he writes these songs of praise, he's focusing on God, and as he focuses on God, then his problems are sorted out. As he focuses on God, his doubt is sorted out. And as he focuses on God, his their pride is sorted out. And that's why we sing. We sing not only to give glory to God, but to help us in our Christian faith, to make us feel who, who we are. Because, you see, the Christian life is not only about the head and the heart. It's about our feelings too. So it's not only about commitment, it's not only about intellect, but it's also about how we feel. And of course, you've heard people saying it's absolutely true. It's not what you feel that's important, it's who you are that's important. And that's obviously very, very true. But God also wants you to have that sense that you belong to him. That's why the, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is called a seal. Uh, he's called a seal, a guarantee. It's, it's to reassure us. That's why we sing blessed assurance. We know that we're Christ's because the Holy Spirit lives within us. And there's that wee voice in us that reminds us that we are God. And so David, David gets it right. Saul gets it wrong because Saul wants it all about me. David gets it right because he all wants it all about God and he wants it all about Saul. And he ministers to Saul, even though Saul doesn't like him. Uh, he, they, he said, they say he likes him here, but later on he tries to kill him. He continues to minister to him because that's the way you should as you look after those who you serve. And therefore it reminds us that each one of us need to be like David, that David might, we're called to be children of God and that's a wonderful privilege. We're called to be heirs of salvation. That's not wonderful. We're called to be friends of God. And sometimes we can get very cocky about that. Sometimes we think, boy, we are better than others. And certainly that's how the world sees us at times. But God calls us to serve the world, even though the world doesn't know God. God calls us to serve the world, even though the world is under judgment. And why do we do that? It's so that we have opportunity to tell and to love them as Christ loved them, and as David loved Saul. Let's pray together. 
Father, again, we thank you for your word, that your word is a comfort to our hearts. It is a light to our path. And it is a sword that we might fight off the evil one. Lord, help us to go forward in your name this week that we may serve you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God with our offering. Our final hymn is a lovely hymn, it's a hymn that you know very well. It's These Are the Days of Elijah. Let's all stand as we worship. Just can't get the staff at all, you know that. Let's let's pray together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and for always. Amen. <laughs>